Awesome. So it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Moises Torres Gonzalez, who's the Vice President of Nutrition Research at the National Dairy Council. In this role, he serves as the subject matter expert on dairy foods and chronic diseases. Moises works to strategically define, develop, and manage the research needed to build scientific understanding about the role dairy foods, including the role that whole fat dairy foods play as part of dietary patterns aimed to reduce the risk of chronic diseases and to help maintain optimal human health. He holds a PhD in nutritional sciences from the University of Connecticut, and prior to joining the National Dairy Council, he held scientific positions at Oregon State University and the School of Medicine at UC San Diego. Please join, and please join me in welcoming Moises Torres Gonzalez as our opening speaker. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Dean Glenda, for the kind introduction. And also thank you for, uh, to the Dairy Innovation Hub for inviting me today to participate in this very important event. It's for me an honor to be here today and more because I will be talking about uh, a topic that I'm very passionate about. This is about whole meal dairy foods and cardiometabolic health. So for my presentation today, I will go over the following. I will briefly just mention the current saturated fat recommendations based on the dietary guidelines for Americans. Then I will be briefly uh, do an overview of the states of the science on LDL cholesterol, uh, saturated fat, and cardiovascular disease. I think that these first two points are really relevant background information that will serve as introduction for the main part of this presentation, that is whole meal dairy foods, dairy fat, and cardiometabolic health. Then I will bring to your attention this emerging concept called the food matrix. This concept of this uh, uh, dairy food matrix has been proposed as a way to explain the unexpected uh, effects of consuming whole milk dairy food with cardiometabolic health. And then I will finish my presentation by giving you the main takeaways of, of today's presentation. So I think that it's fair to say that uh, uh, dietary recommendations focused on saturated fat recommendations hasn't changed here in the United States since the inception of the dietary guidelines back in 1980. Currently, it's still is uh, recommended that we should not consume uh, or that the calories coming from saturated fat should be limited to less than 10% of the calories in per day. Something that I have noticed that they are making more and more emphasis is this replacement that saturated fats should be replaced by uh, unsaturated fats, particularly polyunsaturated fatty acids, because there are uh, benefits, cardiometabolic benefits associated with consuming more polyunsaturated fatty acids. But what is the, the problem? What is the basis for these recommendations? You might have uh, seen this before, or you might have heard about it. Well, saturated fat is part of this diet heart paradigm where uh, this paradigm indicates that because saturated fat can increase the blood levels or LDL cholesterol, still this biomarker that is believed to be the best predictor for cardiovascular disease, then it has been assumed that saturated fat increases the cardiovascular disease risk. However, our understanding uh, on lipid metabolism and the association with cardiovascular disease has evolved. We have learned more and more, and there are some studies indicating that some biomarkers might predict better the CBD risk than LDL cholesterol, but others, uh, other uh, studies indicating that we should look at several of these biomarkers, what set of uh, biomarkers, because it's very challenging or, or very simplistic in some way to try to explain the cardiovascular uh, disease risk, these multifactorial complex diseases just relying on one single biomarker. So in the following slides, I will just give some high-level relevant information about these new uh, biomarkers and some of the, the rationale why some of them has been proposed to better predict cardiovascular disease risk. And let's start with LDL. So we have learned a lot about LDL. Uh, we know that LDL particles are not homogeneous, that they vary in terms of size and density. 
the smaller the LDL particle, the denser, and the more heterogenic. And this is because uh, the LDL, small LDL particles, can penetrate more easily into the arte intima, where they are more, also more susceptible to oxidation. Oxidation of the LDL particles basically triggers the atherosclerotic cascade. Therefore, you can have like two people with similar, similar LDL cholesterol levels, like 100 and 100, like in the slide here. But if in one person, the cholesterol is carried mostly in a small, dense LDL particles, then this person is gonna be in a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So that's why some studies suggest that measuring the concentration of small LDL particles would be a better uh, predictor of cardiovascular disease. Another uh, biomarker is getting more and more uh, uh, relevance is measuring apolipoprotein B. Apolipoprotein B, ApoB, is found in this series of lipoproteins. And all of these uh, lipoproteins carries uh, an atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis risks. Therefore, uh, if when you measure total ApoB, basically you are capturing all the proteogenic lipoproteins. That's why studies suggest that this is a more accurate marker to predict cardiovascular disease risk. Other biomarkers are getting also more important more because the condition that we are facing nowadays here in, in, in the U.S. is hypertriglyceridemia or elevated blood triglycerides. Um, hypertriglyceridemia is an independent risk factor for the development of atherosclerosis uh, or uh, sorry, cardiovascular diseases, even after correction of other risk factors. Interestingly, like um, high plasma triglycerides is often, is often correlated with low levels of HDL cholesterol and also with higher concentration of small dense LDL particles. Also interestingly is that high fat diet seems to be very effective to de uh, decrease the blood levels of triglycerides and high carbohydrate diets, mostly composed of simple carbohydrates, can increase the blood triglycerides. The other important uh, uh, component of, uh, uh, for cardiovascular disease prediction is related with the HDL functionality. It's no longer important just to have high uh, blood levels of LGL, HDL cholesterol, but also to determine the, the efficiency of this HDL to basically carry out its function, that is cholesterol efflux, meaning that the capacity that HDL has to pick up the cholesterol from the hepatic tissues, bring it back to the liver, and then in this way is excreted. So in this regard, APOA1 is really important for the HDL functionality. Basically, uh, HDL, uh, I'm sorry, APOA1 determines the functionality of HDL, but also APOA1 by itself it has very important uh, anti-cardiovascular uh, uh, functions such as anti-inflammatory or antioxidant uh, activity. Uh, studies have shown that efficient HDL cholesterol efflux capacity is associated with reduced risk of atherosclerosis. On the contrary, this functional HDL uh, reduces the cholesterol efflux capacity of HDL, but also the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activities of uh, HDL. Other biomarker that is uh, uh, being recognized more and more is inflammation. And actually, cardiometabolic diseases are recognized as low-grade uh, chronic systematic inflammatory diseases. Some uh, pro-inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines have been associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, such as CRP1, IL-6, IL-1-beta, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And the other one is the little lipoprotein A. And here, this is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Studies suggest that this is involved in thrombogenesis, but also contributes to the onset and progression of atherosclerosis. Even though it is believed that the levels of little lipoproteins are genetically predetermined, there are some studies that indicate that intake of trans fatty acids from partially hydrogenated uh, vegetable oils increases the levels of lipoprotein A, but also uh, a study showed that when you decrease the saturated fat intake, uh, there is an increase in little lipoprotein A. Now, this is related with uh, uh, 
early uh, lipid metabolism, but also we have getting more evidence coming more from perspective the type of studies that basically you can collect and follow a, a participant for a long uh, period of time. In that way, you can uh, look for association between different lifestyles with heart and point of diseases. In this regard, we have seen more and more evidence coming from observational studies and meta-analysis, systematic reviews from observational studies that indicate that saturated fat consumption might not be linked with cardiovascular disease. One of the first studies that kind of shake the status quo on saturated fat was the one published back in 2010. This, is, uh, this was a meta-analysis of prospective cohort studies that included 21 observational studies. Basically, this study found that there was no significant evidence that concludes that consumption of uh, saturated fat increases the risk of coronary heart disease, stroke, or cardiovascular disease. Four years later, it was published this other paper that also caused a lot of controversy in the community, uh, uh, in scientific community. And this, uh, the reason for this, it was because two things. First, confirm what this first study published in 2010 found, meaning that consumption of saturated fat was not associated with increased risk of coronary heart disease. But the second part of this is that also found that consumption of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid did not also decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. So basically, the conclusion from this study was that the current evidence didn't uh, support cardiovascular guidelines that encourage high consumption of polyunsaturated fatty acids and reduction in total saturated fats. A year later, the WHO commissioned this uh, systematic review meta-analysis uh, looking at the association of uh, saturated fat intake and trans fatty acids related with total mortality, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes. But uh, interesting related to saturated fat is that this study basically confirmed what these other two studies found, that saturated fat were not associated with all cause of mortality, cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, ischemia stroke, or type 2 diabetes. Experts supporting the saturated fat recommendations criticized these, uh, uh, these previous studies indicating that at the end of the day, what these studies were doing is comparing saturated fat intake with carbohydrates, simple carbohydrate intake. That's why they were finding no differences or they were not finding that saturated fat increases the, the cardiovascular disease risk. For that, the, the discussion of saturated fat was refocused, and now they were making uh, emphasis, and we should pay attention to what you are comparing to, and meaning with what other micronutrients or type of fat saturated fat is compared. So with that in mind, basically they established this type of uh, replacing statistical modeling uh, studies, where they basically uh, do this exercise to see what happens if you substitute saturated fat with isocaloric amount of other type of fats. What happens with your cardiovascular disease risk? And as you can see in this graph, for instance, with, when you substitute saturated fat with trans fatty acid, basically this results in more detrimental effects. However, if you substitute trans, uh, sat uh, saturated fatty acids with MUFAS, PUFAS, or complex carbohydrate, then you see a benefit. There is a reduction on cardiovascular disease. And the benefits is greater for if you consume or you substitute saturated fat with PUFAS. And you didn't see any benefits if you substitute saturated fat with uh, simple carbohydrates. And basically, this is what these uh, uh, experts were indicating, that when you compare saturated fat with simple carbohydrates, that's precisely you don't see any benefits. And this is basically the one of the basis by the current uh, recommendations by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, but also by other health authorities, such as the American Heart Association, where they uh, make emphasis that we should lower our saturated fat intake and replacing it with unsaturated fat, especially polyunsaturated fatty acids, because this will lower the incidence of cardiovascular disease. What is kind of interesting is that the study that I showed before has been replicated here in the U.S. When they has been tried to do the same outside of the U.S., these findings have not been replicated. For instance, this study that was published uh, three years ago that used uh, a cohort study from Europe, they also look at dietary fatty acids and micronutrient substitution with the incidence of coronary heart disease. What they found is that when they look at 
just uh, total fat and the different type of fat uh, with uh, coronary heart disease, they found no association of dietary fat and type of fat with coronary heart disease. Then, when they conduct this substitution analysis, they found that replacing saturated fat, similarly to the studies that conducted here in the US, with MUFAS, PUFAS, or carbohydrate, didn't result in any beneficial association with coronary heart disease. And, see, and if we add another layer to this discussion, I think that on one hand is being recognized more and more that uh, switching fat does not necessarily result in overall more nutrition practical food choices. What that means is we, we know that some sources of saturated fat are also very important sources of very essential, very important essential nutrients required for optimal, optimal human health. So with that in mind, this group of investigators, what they did is do this replacing modeling type of work and use and using as a case study whole meal dairy foods and they replace these sources of saturated fat with sources of uh, PUFAS and MUFAS. And they look at what happened at the dietary patterns if they do this replacement in terms of nutrient contribution. And basically, and not surprisingly for me, is that this resulted in dietary patterns low in calcium, vitamin D, vitamin A, riboflavin, niacin, vitamin B12. And overall, in dietary pattern, we lower nutrient density scores than the average American eating pattern. The main, uh, main uh, takeaway from this study is that this oversimplification of saturated fat substitution without considering the source may have zero unintended health consequences. Now, we take all these pieces together. Basically, this hard diet, hard paradigm, it seems like it's more complex. In other words, is that this story between saturated fat in cardiovascular disease is more complex than we thought. With that, now we are moving on and talking about cardio, uh, whole meal dairy foods and cardiometabolic health. Because the, 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 sake of, because, uh, uh, the lack of time here, I cannot go and describe all the body evidence, but in general, I can tell that when you look at the body evidence accumulated until now, this indicates that dairy foods Dairy foods, regardless of the fat content, have a neutral or beneficial uh, association with risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and blood pressure. So what I will be showing you in the few slides is just examples of these type of studies focusing on whole meat dairy foods that in some way support this, this statement. Similar to the, the, the evidence that we have uh, seen related to saturated fat and cor uh, coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease, we have seen accumulated uh, evidence from systematic reviews and meta-analysis that indicates that dairy foods, regardless of the fat content, is associated with lower risk of total mortality and cardiovascular diseases. And this has been seen in the last 10, 15 years. Something that I want to highlight is this study. It's a prospective uh, cohort study. It's a multi-country study. And why I want to highlight, because this I think that is a very unique study in the sense that look at dairy consumption outside of uh, countries that normally don't consume dairy foods. Because this study included that information from uh, low and middle income countries, again, where maybe dairy foods are not part of the regular diet. But what was very interesting is that these uh, group of researchers found that higher consumption of total dairy foods, regardless of the fat content, and this was when it was comparing consuming more than two servings versus uh, not consuming, was associated with reduced risk of total mortality, non-cardiovascular mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality, major cardiovascular disease, and a stroke. Now, some of the limitation of uh, relying uh, on the, of, of prospective observational study is that most of them rely on food frequency questionnaires. And the limitation in these type of studies is that recall bias and misreporting. Right? We may not remember what we consumed yesterday, and more important, maybe the amount. So the expert has proposed uh, uh, looking at uh, some biomarkers that are 
particular characteristics are uh, uh, found in some foods in order to have a better estimation of the consumption of this uh, type of food. So they have proposed in terms of uh, dairy fat uh, consumption and consumption of whole meat dairy food, uh, these three fatty acids, uh, pentadecanoic acid, heptadecanoic acid, transpalmitolate. Studies have shown that when there is an, uh, an increased consumption of dairy fat or whole meat dairy foods, there is an elevation in the blood levels of these fatty acids. So with this type of approach, basically we have seen accumulation studies more and more indicating that elevated levels of these uh, fatty acids that again are associated with increased consumption or higher consumption of whole meat dairy foods and dairy fat are associated with lower risk of coronary heart disease, cardiovascular disease, or lower incidence of atherogenic dyslipidemia. Can just confirm what these uh, other type of observational studies have found. Now, we have also seen uh, evidence from randomized controlled trials. The evidence from randomized controlled trials are considered a higher quality, uh, and that kind of uh, uh, information also that the, we, are, uh, we have seen related with whole milk dairy consumption kind of aligns and support what we have seen in the observational type of study. As an example, is this a study that evaluated the consumption of whole milk dairy foods as part of the DASH diet? You might have heard about the DASH diet. The DASH di diet is highly recommended because it's very effective to reduce the blood pressure. In general, the DASH diet is considered a low fat, low saturated fat, and recommends only low-fat and fat-free dairy uh, foods as part of this dietary pattern. So in this study, what the researchers did is, what happened if I include whole meat dairy foods as part of the DASH diet? So what they did, they compared just the standard DASH diet with a high fat diet that included full-fat dairy foods. Something important to mention here that because the diet is very so caloric, so in order to accommodate the full-fat dairy foods, they decrease the carbohydrate intake. And these two diets were uh, compared with a control diet that is the typical American diet. So what they found. First of all, the first question is just to see if the incorporation of whole milk dairy foods was effective to lower a blood pressure because that's the main characteristic of the DASH diet. What they found is that the modified DASH diet with full fat dairy foods maintained the DASH blood pressure benefits. The second question is that you increase the saturated fat a consumption when you modify the DASH diet. What happens with LDL cholesterol? Interestingly, it was found that despite a higher saturated fat content in the modified DASH diet, there were no the statistical differences between these two diets. The other interesting finding was that they, they, they found that the high, high fat DASH diet increased the LDL uh, peak compared with the DASH diet indicating that induces the formation of the less heterogenic LDL particle. Now, what happened with other lipid biomarkers? Some of the, the negative benefits, if you will, related with the standard DASH diet is that some studies have shown to decrease blood levels of HDL cholesterol and to increase the blood levels of uh, triglycerides. So this study found that the modified uh, DASH diet did not decrease the blood levels of HDL cholesterol when compared with the control diet, and also the high-fat DASH diet significantly reduced plasma triglycerides compared with the DASH diet. The findings from this study indicate that full fatary foods could be incorporated into the DASH dietary pattern without impairing its positive healthy effects on blood pressure, and is perhaps superior in terms of blood lipid profile. We have seen another type of studies that also have compared the consumption of regular fatty foods with lower varieties. For instance, this one that compared the consumption of uh, regular cheese with reduced fat cheese. This was a, a parallel uh, intervention trial for two, 12 weeks in subjects with, uh, with two or more characteristics of the metabolic syndrome. At the end of the study, basically, there were not statistical differences among the, the three groups related with total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and any of the other biomarkers that were determined. This other study was conducted in healthy individuals, and they, uh, they were asked to incorporate into their diet skin milk or whole milk. Not other dairy products were consumed. So at the end of the study, they found that despite of uh, a higher consumption, 
of saturated fat and overall high energy intake. When the participants were consuming whole milk, there were no statistical differences related to the cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, insulin, glucose, and was also interesting that whole milk intake increased the levels of HDL cholesterol. This last one compared a controlled diet with a diet that consumed low-fat dairy foods and full-fat dairy foods. And the, the participants in this study were just asked to incorporate these foods into the diet. So at the end of the study, they found that uh, there were no statistical difference among the three uh, uh, diets related with total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, free fatty acids, and blood pressure. Again, just indicating the same kind of alignment related with the evidence that we have seen from observational studies. So what about obesity? This is another important limitation of not recommending or barrier for not recommending uh, whole meat dairy foods. The whole meat dairy foods contain more uh, fat and therefore more calories. So there is this idea that when you consume foods that are rich in fat because you are ended up consuming more calories, that would increase the risk of obesity. And we are facing an uh, obesity crisis globally. So related with whole meal and the association with obesity is also kind of interestingly, because from observational studies, we have seen that uh, the, this hypothesis that dairy fat or high fat would increase the risk of obesity basically doesn't apply to whole meal dairy foods and suggests that high fat dairy uh, fat consumption within typical dietary uh, patterns is actually associated with lower risk of, uh, of obesity. This study that was conducted here in the U.S., they look at the association of uh, the typical foods consumed here in the U.S. with gain weight every four years. The participants were followed for 20 years, so every four years they were checking the body weight. And I will focus here on dairy foods. Uh, in general, we can say that actually dairy foods were either positive or neutral in terms of uh, uh, reducing the risk of obesity. Just to highlight here some of the findings. For instance, in this graph, uh, it's indicated that each serving of plain or artificial sweetened yogurt was associated with actual uh, 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 a loss of weight when, uh, for every four years. And related to whole milk, here is uh, each serving of whole meal or low-fat meal was not associated with gain change every four years. At the end of the day, uh, this basically supports that, well, whole milk doesn't increase the risk of obesity. This other study, uh, they look at also consumption of milk uh, in women and look at the obesity risk. The women were followed for 17 years and they found that those uh, participants, those consumers, or those, well, those individuals that are reporting to consume more whole dairy foods, they have a lower risk of, of uh, obesity after 18, 17 years. So what about type 2 diabetes? There is a correlation that in the increase in obesity that we have seen is also associated with increase in type 2 diabetes. And actually, obesity and type 2 diabetes are known as the twin uh, diseases. Well, related to whole meal dairy foods and also using the same approach that looking at these biomarkers that I mentioned earlier, is the studies have shown that those participants with the higher levels of these particular dairy fatty acids they have lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And this was based on a study conducted here in the US. A similar study, but including data from 12 countries, confirmed or find similar results, where they found that higher circulating levels of fatty acid biomarkers of dairy fat consumption, C15, C17, and transpalmitolaic, were associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And more recently, there was published this paper that they look at the whole uh, uh, fat dairy consumption with uh, the risk of syn uh, metabolic syndrome, uh, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. This also was a multi-country type of study. What they found is that when the participants reporting to consume more than two servings of whole meat dairy foods, this was linked to 28% or lower uh, prevalence of metabolic syndrome. And that uh, when they uh, found that participants were going to consume three daily servings of dairy foods, including whole meat dairy foods, it was linked to 14% or lower incidence of type 2 diabetes and blood pressure. So at the end of the day, basically, it seemed like whole meat dairy foods could have benefits rather than negative impact on health. 
So what is in, in homemade dairy food? Is there something different? So I want now to introduce the dairy matrix. As this has been, again, an emerging concept that has been used to explain this unexpected result of homemade dairy foods. But before getting there, let's, let's just have a good understanding of what's the food matrix. Basically, the food matrix can be defined as the uh, nutrient, nut, nutrient components and also the physical and chemical interaction of these components within the food that uh, can affect the digestion of food, but also the absorption, the bioaccessibility and viability of nutrients, but also uh, the formation and probably to, e uh, to make easier the absorption of bioactives. And that is something that is being more and more recognized in food, bioactives. As you can see here, bioactives are defined as a constituent in food other than those that meet basic nutritional needs, meaning that these components have a positive health benefit. Now, this same concept can be applied to dairy foods, and it's called the dairy matrix. And basically, this concept invites to look at dairy foods beyond just a simple delivery of nutrients. Uh, they, basically, if we want to have a, a, an idea how we think about dairy matrix is that a whole is greater than the sum of in individual parts. And also that the presence or absence of individual nutrient did not determine the health impact of a food in, in, a, in, a, in a human disease or in a human health. We, we know that, uh, for instance, milk provides these essential nutrients. There is no question about it. But also the importance how these nutrients are found in dairy are very important. I mentioned before the, uh, the bioactives, and this is more and more interest to really identify and determine more, uh, the type of bioactives that can be found in dairy products. In milk, we know that there are uh, <clears throat> bioactive components originated from proteins, the peptides, and also from lipid fraction and a well from carbohydrates. Briefly, related to peptides, well, this, I think that this is uh, some of the ones that are more studied, and the studies have uh, shown that uh, bioactive components from protein origin, these peptides, they have shown in in vitro and animal models, uh, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, antithrombotic, and antihypertensive, uh, and glucose control benefits. Related with carbohydrates, well, uh, there are some studies indicating that the carbohydrates found in, in milk can have prebiotic effects, mean also to man, help to maintain mineral balance and facilitate calcium absorption. I want to spend a little bit more talking about dairy lipid bioactives because this is a particular characteristic of whole meat dairy foods, right? First of all, I think that there is no question that uh, dairy fat is one of the most complex, diverse type of fat found in a food, right? It's composed of more than 400 types of fatty acids. Yes, 65% of these fatty acids are saturated fatty acids, but also there are different classes of saturated fa fatty acids in, in dairy fat. In addition to that, well, we know that this fat is encapsulated in what is called the milk fat global membrane. This membrane is rich in polylipids, phospholipids and sphingolipids. Now, the studies are indicating, for instance, the different type of fatty acids, but also polylipids, may have bioactive uh, uh, activities. Related with a, a short chain, medium chain, a long chain fatty acids, some studies have shown that could be very useful to uh, weight management. Some of them has been proposed to activate the oxidative metabolism in mitochondria, therefore increases the fat oxidation. Or chain uh, saturated fatty acids, as I mentioned before, and trans fatty acids. Uh, some studies suggest that they may have some potential mechanistic role in reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes. Brand chain fatty acids, that is, this type of fatty acids also are getting more and more attention, and actually there are some studies indicating that these are a better biomarker of dairy fat consumption, while some uh, animal studies, in vitro uh, uh, studies, suggest that they may have anti-inflammatory properties. And studies related with the lipids found in the uh, milk fat global membrane, phospholipids, lipids, there are, uh, 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 human studies, in vitro studies, and animal models suggesting that they may have 
potential role in reducing cholesterol absorption and fat absorption, therefore decreasing at the end of the day the uh, blood levels of cholesterol and total cholesterol, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol in the plasma, as well as having potentially anti-inflammatory uh, uh, benefits. So something that also is important to mention is that dairy matrix is not created equal. There are different dairy matrices depends on the very product. Right? We have the milk, which is a liquid uh, type of matrix, but then we have the matrix of yogurt that is semi-gel, semi-liquid, and then we have the matrix of cheeses, mostly hard. And each matrix has its unique nutrient and bioactive content, and also that could uh, make or differentiate each of these dairy products in terms of the benefits associated with human health. So talking about, for instance, cheese. Cheese has a bad reputation, right? Even when we love cheese, uh, cheese has a bad reputation because the sodium content and fat content, right? Uh, uh, because the sodium content, people uh, assume that it's gonna increase the risk of hypertension, and because the saturated fat content, people assume that it's gonna increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. However, what is very interesting is we are seeing more and more studies indicating that actually cheese have the opposite, the opposite, the opposite uh, result. For instance, this relatively recent, that was published last year, meta-analysis looking at cheese and <clears throat> overall human health, they found that cheese was associated with reduced risk of all-cause mortality and cardiovascular uh, disease mortality with lower incidence of cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, total fracture, and dementia. Not linked with incidence of high blood pressure and prostate cancer or, or with cancer mortality. Uh, the conclusion from this uh, paper was that the findings uh, indicate that cheese consumption has neutral or moderate benefits to, for human health. Again, just contrary to what we would assume based on the, uh, on the presence of sodium or of fat in the cheese. And this is just a clear example of the dairy matrix aspect of food. For instance, this study was kind of interesting because they look at uh, uh, different food sources of sodium. On one hand, we know that a high consumption of, of sodium increases oxidative stress. And independently of the effects on hypertension or uh, blood pressure, they could uh, affect microvascular dysfunction. Microvascular dysfunction is one of the first signs that could trigger a greater uh, vascular uh, effect, like a stroke. So then again, it has been assumed that sources of sodium would cause a microvascular dysfunction. So in this study that was a cute study, they compare different, uh, different doses of sodium coming from cheddar cheese with pretzel or soy cheese. You don't see here uh, the, the soy cheese because actually the participants didn't tolerate the taste of too much uh, soy cheese. So that's why you don't see a great level. But what's kind of interesting is that cheddar cheese protect against microvascular dysfunction. And how they confirm that? When uh, later on, when they repeat this study, they, for the participants consuming these other sources of, of sodium, they also receive a dose of uh, vitamin C. This antioxidant. So they saw that the microvascular fun function was restored. With these studies, the, uh, the, the authors concluded that there's something in cheese that they, it has an antioxidant activity. That's why cheese consumption protects against microvascular dysfunction. Now, what about yogurt? Well, on one hand, the evidence indicates that consumption of dairy foods is associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And we are seeing more and more evidence indicating that yogurt might be the, the type of dairy food to be more protective against the risk of type 2 diabetes. So in this meta-analysis that was published back in 2018, basically indicates that, as you can see here, basically saying that all dairy is associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes, but if we look closer to yogurt, the studies indicate that yogurt, regardless of the fat content, regardless of its flavor or no flavor yogurt, is associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And because we are seeing more and more evidence accumulated in this regard, recently, and I'm sure that you are aware of that, the FDA approved this qualified claim related to yogurt and reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. 
And again, if you check these approved uh, qualified claims, the FDA did not make any emphasis that the type of yogurt that you should consume is low fat or fat free. It says yogurt, right? Because again, the evidence here is strong uh, indicating that consumption of yogurt, incorporated yogurt in your, in your diet uh, will help to decrease the risk of type 2 diabetes. Could be the uh, microorganism present there, could be the bioactives that can be produced in the fermentation process, or the overall yogurt matrix. That is also more and more research in, in this regard that is needed. So the, the matrix actually has been proposed by a global experts in this regard, and they, and they recommend that they should be considered uh, they, they may should be uh, considered for future dietary recommendations. They published this position paper in the Journal of American College Cardiology, and they uh, basically make the point that a food-based approach to guiding saturated fat intake is warranted. And they acknowledge that foods have very complex matrices, and their health effects cannot be predicted by the content of any individual nutrient. And they put as an example of this type of uh, foods like that provide saturated fat, whole milk dairy foods, unprocessed red meat, and, their, and dark chocolate. Also, they make the, the point that the new recommendations should emphasize food-based strategies that translate for the public into understandable, consistent, and robust recommendation for healthy dietary patterns. At the end, again, they are just making that Foods, some foods are more than simple delivery systems of nutrients. So we should look at hell at more, a more complex uh, uh, type of, of, of. So now finishing up, my uh, main takeaways from my presentations is that, yes, we acknowledge that there is still limits of saturated fat consumption to be less than 10% uh, of total calories. This is in case of the DGA. Um, but also the body evidence indicates that saturated fat consumption might not be directly associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, but also it indicates that saturated fat on its own may be a poor metric for identifying healthy foods or diet. Now related with whole meat dairy foods, the evidence supports that dairy, uh, dairy foods and, and dairy fat might be linked to decreased risk of cardiometabolic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension. Additionally, related with yogurt, whole meal, uh, uh, the body evidence indicates that consumption of yogurt, regardless of the fat content, might be uh, uh, linked to reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. And the following characteristics of dairy foods may contribute to the overall effects on cardiometabolic health. And this is when we talk about whole meat dairy foods, the unique and multidiverse fatty acid profile and the organization of this fat into whole meat uh, dairy food, the dairy food matrix of these unique and complex physical and chemical structures on individual dairy foods. And of course, the unique and nutrient contribution of milk and other dairy foods to healthy eating patterns. So with that, I finished my presentation and I think that we have time for questions. Right. Uh, well, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I know dairy was amazing, but now you are just uh, telling me go back to 2%. No more skim milk for me. So, uh, but my question is regarding, you said the LDL particle size matters. Uh, when you go to the doctor and you get your results, do they take that into account? When, or wh what do they measure there? Or like, do they take density in the equation? No, that's a great question. And um, talking, well, uh, well, the discussion about that is currently is not part of the, this regular blood analysis that they do, um, because some of these, for instance, results I have been showing is more for research purposes. So there is not a still like uh, not expensive way to measure in a clinical setting. But what I have 
heard and also being in this uh, type of discussions is that there is this really interest for cardiologists to include uh, determination of not only the LDL particle size, but also APOV and little lipoprotein A. I know that in some uh, private institutions they do that. For instance, Mayo Clinic can do that, but no one could afford to go to Mayo Clinic, right? So I know that there is some interest that those can be integrated, again, in just the regular lipid profile analysis that you do when you go to the doctor. So do you foresee a time when instead of ingredients on um, foods, we actually have a food matrix? Talking about all those components. So instead of milk, a list of the things that you, know, you listed were bioactives. Yes, I think that in, uh, from the dairy perspective is that we are going in some way because uh, what is interesting also that we thought that we know everything about dairy foods, right? We know all about compositions, but we learn more and more, and we're identifying more and more bioactives. Of course, there is this interest to isolate these bioactives and incorporate in other foods, we're having the idea that uh, they could provide these benefits that have been shown in some studies. Um, you know, I, I, I am a lipid type of guy. I love lipids, so I would see these evolving related with polar lipids. Uh, for instance, some of the studies that have been conducted in human studies, um, they incorporate these polar lipids, for instance, in cheese. They increase, they add it to, I don't know, a whipping cream. So then there is this idea to kind of get these bioactives incorporated in different foods uh, with the idea that uh, can provide those benefits. At least in a couple of human studies, those benefits have been confirmed. So I think that there is a big opportunity for innovation, for instance, product innovation. Mm -hmm. As long as the microphone is in this corner of the room here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious if the, some of the beneficial effects that you mentioned, um, and you can think specifically about the lipids, are depend in part on the age, um, right through the lifespan of people. How are, does that play out? Great question, great question. Um, some of the, for instance, some of the evidence that we have from observational type of studies have been done in adults. And, but also I think that is, it's hard to say that only a certain population bear of the age. Because for instance, the uh, prospective observational studies, they include sometimes participants 48 years and older, some other like 20 years and older. Evidence from randomized control trials, for instance, normally uh, they also have a big range of age when they include the participants. So I feel like in some way it's safe to say that could have these uh, beneficial uh, effects across the lifespan. However, uh, now with these trends about, for instance, precision nutrition, personalized nutrition, something that uh, can be said in a speculative way is that some uh, people, some subjects might respond better to certain dairy foods than others. Or some uh, dairy products may show greater benefits in certain people than others. And that's why I was kind of putting the example of these uh, uh, the the uh, uh, the study that was conducted in 21 countries, because again the idea is that most of the what we know about dairy foods health benefits have been conducted in countries that they consume dairy foods, right? Uh, that is part of the, the 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 culture. So in these other ones, for instance, the idea was that well maybe those benefits that you are seeing in the U.S. might not be seen in this country where dairy is not part of the culture. But at least there is some insight that may actually provide uh, great benefits. And if we take in consideration that in low income country, there is this other important barrier or uh, situation that affect this population that is uh, undernutrition, right? Just having in mind all these nutrients that dairy food can provide. But in addition to that, that can, can prevent 
uh, the risk of these other metabolic diseases that are affecting the world worldwide. So I think that I feel like it's safe in some way to say that the benefits of dairy food can be uh, through the lifespan. Hi, this is a similar question to the age, but in those studies where they had the multiple countries and just very longitudinal, how did they control for the fact that they were eating other foods? You know, they weren't solely eating dairy. No, that's a great question. And that's something, uh, some of the limitations of the perspective type of studies, right? One thing is I, I mentioned the, the, the way that they collect data uh, information related with dietary intake. And most of them apply for frequency questionnaires. So uh, there is the recall bias and misreporting. The other thing is precisely the confounding factors. Even though when these experts try to adjust for different multiple factors, there is also uh, the possibility that there were some other factors that were not adjusted and might not uh, 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 kind of really represent what the conclusions are. So to your point, for instance, they normally, they know that there are, for instance, association of consuming uh, fish, right, with reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. So what the experts do is adjust for that, right? So just to try to be, to try to get closer that the, the association that they are seeing is just associated with consumption of whole dairy foods. And it's not making noise the consumption of fish or other products. Could that make sense? Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, we've got one right over here. You come in, Marta. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, kind of building up on the discussion from the questions we had so far, uh, I would be very curious if there was also any effect on either the the breed of of dairy animal, because that can change in different places, and also animal diet, because in some countries there's more grass-based diets versus more grain-based diets. I was wondering if that was something that came up um, in those studies. Thank you. Uh, normally, no, uh, but uh, of course there has been this great interest, right? as you pointed out, uh, for instance, in terms of fatty acid composition, we know that varies during the year, right? So you may end up having uh, milk with different fatty acid composition. Uh, the other aspect is the, the feeding that provided to the cow. For instance, the, some the places where they uh, in, follow like a grass-fed type of feeding, and they uh, uh, indicate that in addition that the fatty acid composition is different than milk, there are also the presence of some polyphenols, some antioxidants. And uh, the question there is, as this is translated to better benefits, I think that we don't know yet, because when, for instance, when we are doing these different uh, analyses across the globe, right, you basically put all together. So it's different to think, okay, no, let's just analyze their products that come from cows that just was grass-fed versus conventional. So, but at the end, I would say that in some way, this position, dairy products, regardless of the, of the type of feeding, uh, in a good position. But I feel like that is a great opportunity for research still, because we are learning more and more about these little uh, changes in composition uh, that, yeah, we may have uh, some additional benefits. Yeah. All right, so here at UW, we embrace the continual sifting and winnowing, continual and fearless sifting and winnowing of scientific ideas. So I think this has been such a great ex uh, example of that and a great thing for all of us to think about. If you're really interested in this type of research, the Dairy Innovation Hub has funded several projects in this area. 
uh, with health enhancing benefits of cheese all the way to incorporating bioactives from dairy into other products to improve their characteristics. So I encourage you to check out the project showcase on the website if you haven't, where all of the projects we've funded are shared on there and you can reach out to the researchers on that. So with that to kick us off and to put us all in the mindset of great inquiry and uh, collaborative thought processes, I would encourage you to refill your coffee, maybe check out some posters on your way. We're going to move into the breakout rooms for those sessions that will start at 10 and go until noon. So they'll go right up to lunch. One of those rooms is down on this floor to my left, and the other one is down one floor, and you'll follow signs to get to those. So remember, you have two uh, priority areas to pick from this morning, and then this afternoon, you can pick from the remaining two. So uh, grab some coffee, say hi to people from across the room, and head to those breakout rooms. We'll see you back here at noon for lunch. Thank you.